Welcome to the final uh, session of the year of our Center for Global Ethics and Politics. And this event is co-sponsored by SPITSA, or the um, Social and Political Theory Students Association. And uh, we're really delighted uh, today to, um, to have Brooke Acker come. I've wanted her to talk here for a very long time already because uh, her work is right along the lines of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics direction, uh, especially bringing together new thinking and feminist philosophy with um, in international political theory, which itself is a conglomerate of political theory and sort of international relations theory. I don't know if I should even say that word. Um, and uh, also social and political philosophy. So we are very, um, you know, we draw on both philosophy, political science, sociology, and she's a great exemplar of the sort of interdisciplinarity. Um, and her work has really been a very important and, um, and cutting edge. Her first book was entitled Political Theory and Feminist Social Criticism from Cambridge in 2000. And that was followed by the uh, very interesting book Universal Human Rights in a World of Difference, also from Cambridge in 2008. And I like the way um, Brooke uh, advances a sort of grounded, uh, approach, a uh, particularist approach, a bottom-up approach to universality, and it's uh, really interesting uh, to uh, see how she does that. Uh, and her most recent book, which we're going to be getting one of the first uh, tastes of, um, is entitled Just Responsibility, Global Responsibility for Everyday Injustice. And uh, the talk today with that um, and that theme is um, from chapter two of the book, and it's entitled The Intersection of Global Economic, Environmental, and Gender Justice. Brooke, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. That's a lovely introduction. Thank you all for coming on this. Is this your first gorgeous day? You've had a few other gorgeous days. I come from Chicago. I mean, I'm from Nashville, obviously. I'm in Vanderbilt now, but uh, it's a lot colder there. And a lot windier there. So to come here, I feel like um, wrong book. That's wrong book. Oh, this is a very good book. Has anybody seen this book? Um, I was hoping while I was here, Carol would sign it for me. And I think I may um, certainly uh, the the engagement is mutual. Um, Carol's book on democracy and human rights came out the same year that my human rights book came out. So um, uh, we've been parallel playing in. in Similar sandboxes, if not the same sandbox, for a while, and I've really enjoyed being able to exchange uh, scholarship with her. So thank you very much for having me. I also want to thank John for all his coordination. Thanks very much in the Graduate Center. This is my first time in this building, and it's it's really a great space. I'm glad that you all have this now. Um, and it's also a particular honor to be uh, co-hosted by the Ralph Bunch Institute, just because of who Ralph Bunch was and and what he is for um, for those of us who care about human rights and, uh, and peace. And obviously, thank you to the Center for Ethics and Politics for having me. I am here a little bit to celebrate, it's true. It's pretty exciting um, to finish a, uh, a book manuscript. And while it's done, it's not done done, so I welcome your comments and engagement. I'm really looking forward to um, massaging it into its, into its final state. Um, and the, the chapter that I'm sharing with you today is really the puzzle. Uh, Carol's introduction was very nice, and it um, covered just how broad my interests <coughs> are. And perhaps when you saw the title, you thought, really? Somebody's going to take on all of these topics of injustice in one talk? Um, yes, and then some. I'm, I am going to try to ground it a little bit in, um, in a couple of uh, particular, I, I will have a couple of particular things in mind. Um, as I talk about this work, but I'm also going to reach even further than, than just what's caught in the title. So in 2009, a book called Half the Sky um, was written by a husband and wife journalist duo who brought attention to a range of ways in which women, mostly in developing countries, experience oppression. Examples included prostitution, child marriage, and limited education. Now, some of us have been working this field for a while, so there was nothing um, new in that respect in the book. But for many, reformers and philanthropists, 
these harms, like slavery, um, are unjust and were new to many, um, to many audiences. The book and the subsequent movie combined with significant, significant media attention to particular incidents of gender injustice sparked attention to issues of gender injustice around the world. As popular and academic criticism has noted, Half the Sky is stronger on description than it is on analysis of the complexities of the injustice that it describes. To those familiar with the forms of injustice that the book makes central, the author's call to action, particularly in support of the philographic approach to social change, were inadequately analytical of the role of the global political economy in the past and present injustices that they describe in the book. Half the Sky also ignited a parallel discussion about whether gender injustice could be addressed without more extensive criticism of the global political economy. In this latter vein, novelist Teju Cole raised the specter of the white savior industrial complex. This concept, originally in an essay from Gayatri Spivak with the ironic and critical phrase, white men are saving brown women from brown men, is a call for people, thank you, <laughs> it's a old and still a very good joke. And it is a call for people of privilege um, to think differently about philanthropy. It is intended to provoke self-reflection among those who respond to Half the Sky with simplistic acts of charity. The invocation of the white savior industrial complex is an invitation to consider the need for philanthropy. In this critical view, global, social, economic, and political hierarchies are not only specific harms per se, they are the substance of injustice. In Half the Sky, Christophe and Wudan are bringing to popular audiences concerns about people from which the audiences are expected to feel disconnected. Described with a journalistic combination of personal story and statistical evidence, global gender injustice is vivid and epidemic. Women are not just half the sky, as the proverb suggests, but an ocean of unmet need in their hands. Peter Singer, uses a more explicitly utilitarian argument to bring attention to the 1971 famine in Bangladesh in much the same way. The hunger and civil war-torn cyclone struck Bangladesh was unmet need to which individuals who have the capacity to respond, as long as their response does not cost them something of equal moral worth, must respond. As critics of Christophe and Houdin and of Singer have argued, the focus on unmet need wants for analytical purchase on what contributes to these injustices and how they may be addressed effectively by individuals or institutions. The difference between charity and justice is a timeless concern for social reformers. As John Stuart Mill said in the 19th century, quote, the great error of reformers and philanthropists is to nibble at the consequences of unjust power instead of addressing injustice itself. Mill's concern poses two problems. First, the, consequence of the consequences of injustice are always more visible than injustice itself. Moreover, in common usage, we generally use the same word, injustice, to talk about both unjust power relations and their consequences. Thinking about injustice in the broader sense of unjust power relations, that is, as injustice itself, can be difficult because of what feminists call standpoint epistemology. In its richest sense, our context, our situatedness, to use some academic jargon, are obstacles to our being able to perceive injustice itself. They affect what we think we know and what we assume others think we are talking about when we use certain words. Privilege within hierarchy is one aspect of situatedness that constrains the ability of those with privilege to perceive some hierarchies, particularly those in which they enjoy privilege. The second challenge of addressing injustice itself is methodological. How do we explore the complexities of oppressive structures, revealing them and deconstructing their pernicious functions without becoming mired in, process, in the process of deconstruction at the expense of addressing injustice itself. As Rancière worries, engagement in deconstruction leads to developing the art of deconstruction rather than a politics of confronting power inequalities. 
Rosemary Young takes on this challenge by developing a framework for understanding injustice as the constraints on the exercise of freedom caused by oppression and domination, and not as an endless regress, but one revealing five phases of oppression. You may remember exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. According to Young, these are experienced structurally by social groups. This framework has served for decades as a useful corrective to approaches to justice that would focus on justice as a problem of distribution or recognition or both. In the, in the talk today, I want to take this challenge one step further. Thinking through the everyday processes that render unjust hierarchies possible, sustainable, and invisible, I reveal the power politics of injustice itself without being distracted from the importance of transforming those politics. So let me outline what I'm going to do with you today, and then, um, and then get on with it. So after that brief introduction, I'm going to give you an account of um, global justice and everyday injustice as, um, as I understand them with, as grounded in um, epistemological and ontological perspectives. And then I'm going to, believe it or not, turn to Aristotle. Um, and use his typology to set up a discussion of justice and injustice itself, and then give you a brief outline of what I think um, we need to be thinking about in a parallel way when we're understanding responsibility. That's a bit of an interlude in the organization of the talk because actually that comes from a, a latter chapter in the book. And then I'm going to talk about one of the three modes that are important um, to my understanding of injustice itself. There will be three, causality, power relations, and normalization. And the arguments about um, power relations and normalization are quite complicated. And so I will set them up in the discussion of causality and give you some illustration of where I'm going with that. But I won't have time to get into that with too much detail. So the focus of the argument today is really going to be about seeing the epistemological, ontological perspectives on injustice itself rather than focusing just on the consequences of injustice. The psychology literature has taught us that when seeking support for issues of injustice, Christoph and Dunn have the right approach. Stories. Stories can make complexities of injustice human and the human consequences vivid. Political theorists argue that taking on the topic of global justice and responsibility requires, at a minimum, addressing certain global problems. Poverty and economic, global economic structures, global warming, climate justice, and gender inequality. Many have argued for each of those things, if you're not taking on that topic, then you're not really taking on injustice. The challenge is coming up with a framework for revealing the complexities of injustice itself that confront global problems while being relevant to variation in taking up responsibility for injustice, which is required if you're actually going to take responsibility for injustice. Every day, in certain seasons, or all year long, in families, in workplaces, in communities, people face unsafe working conditions and unsafe living conditions. They, say they face insecure livelihoods. They are confronted with food crises and countless other daily threats, including diminishing sources of livelihood, insecure access, access to water, variability in slow onset environmental change, which would be like global warming and river erosion, but also vulnerability to sudden onset environmental events, such as the earthquake that we've seen in Nepal this week. Are these harms, injustices, or the consequence of injustice itself? Throughout the book, I refer to these as everyday injustices. Everyday injustices are the circumstances of everyday life which, taken on their own, might not even be understood as harms, let alone injustices. So everyday injustices, as I was saying, are the circumstances of everyday life which, taken on their own, might not have been understood as harms, let alone injustices, like the daily responsibility for carrying fuel and water. However, when these circumstances and their consequences are experienced over a lifetime, and are confined to a social group, or result in disparate impacts from otherwise seemingly random events, such as a natural disaster, then they are evidence of injustice itself. 
I'm going to offer a framework for understanding the mechanisms of injustice itself and for understanding how the workings of injustice itself are self-concealing. More specifically, I focus on the ways in which, in our various communities, we socialize ourselves towards sharing certain meanings and expectations. For example, we expect causality to be an important feature of injustice. We fail to perceive injustices because we do not fully reflect on the relations of power, not only of the dependencies and interdependencies between people, but also of the dependencies and interdependencies among people. And we fail to perceive certain harms as unjust because normalization renders some harms visible and others not visible or not visible as injustice. And those with different epistemologies, for example, those who experience oppression, are better, better able to notice patterns of oppression, even those that are not their own. This chapter discusses three aspects of injustice itself, as I promised, complex causality, power relations, and normalization. By looking at how these function in everyday injustices, I reveal that some dimensions of these have to do with epistemologies and diverse standpoints. What do the white men, the brown women, and the brown men know? When, and, and what do they know about, how, and how do they know it? Some of these dimensions have to do with ontologies. What is the nature of injustice? Is it a pattern of harms? Is it the process and power relations that produce those harms? Is it the socio-epistemic processes that render the harms and their complex causes invisible? Or is it possibly all of these? What does it mean to take responsibility for injustice in this sense? While I do not offer an answer to this question until the latter half of the book, it is appropriate to be clear about the breadth and depth of the ambition of what I'm calling just responsibility for everyday injustices and justice itself. As John Stuart Mill argues, we are not taking responsibility for injustice if we do not take on the whole problem, but rather just nibble at its unjust consequences. Rather than nibbling at the unjust consequences of power relations, taking responsibility for injustice means taking on the sources and sites of the dynamics of the power relations. However, when we do this, it's not enough to take on the sources of power with an oversimplified critical narrative about omniscient and omnipotent structures. By disaggregating causation, power relations, and normalization, I want to further complicate the challenges of taking on injustice by considering contingencies and interaction effects I want to offer us the most rich account of where our vulnerabilities come from. And therefore, for many, the expectations of what responsibility requires will seem dangerously broad on my account. I want to focus on um, bringing to life some of what Rassier is arguing for. For Rassier, emancipation is, quote, the collectivization of capacities invested in scenes of dissensus. It is the employment of the capacity of anyone whatsoever. There is more to be sought and found in the investigation of this power, that is the power that we have. That is, there's more to be found in the investigation of this power than in the endless task of unmasking fetishes or the endless demonstration of the omnipotence of the beast. Injustice itself is not a vague, omnipotent beast. It is a constellation of epistemological, political dynamics, which, when unpacked, indicates multiple paths for taking up responsibility and calls us to exercise our capacities to confront injustice in a just way. So let's turn to Aristotle. In book five of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle guides the study of injustice by providing some categories for thinking about what kind of justice a harm might be, utilizing the methodology of observation and categorization that worked so well for him observing physical phenomena. Aristotle observes that we use the same word to refer to three different meanings of justice. Complete justice, having to do with a social, economic, and political system that maintains fairness in a particular political community. Relational justice, 
which refers to the distributive, restorative, and reciprocal relations among people within that system. And then the third, Antigone's question, universal justice, in which sense justice is not relative to either our shared political life nor to those we share with. Many theorists since have used this typology of relational injustice as a reference point for describing the aspect of injustice that is their subject. In the framework that I've introduced for thinking about injustice, these relational injustices are different consequences of unjust power relations in this sense. And my argument is that the relational piece of Aristotle is not where we're going to get the traction, but rather in our understanding of universal justice, as um, the Jawa translation translates it. My argument is that this approach can lead, the relational approach, can lead to two problematic forms of simplification. The first, to which Mill draws our attention, is the treatment of the consequences of injustice as the injustice itself. The second, to which Rancière draws our attention, is the treatment of injustice as merely the consequences of unjust power relations instantiated in global structures. Neither over oversimplification confronts the always, already, forever, and yet ever-changing aspect of injustice itself, and the always already forever and yet ever-changing aspects of political agency that we can use to address it. So <coughs> distributive justice is one of the central concerns of theorists of global justice, particularly those who focus on poverty and climate. According to Aristotle, distributive justice concerns itself with pro proportionality. Thomas Pogge uses a distributive approach to global poverty when he argues that the extreme poverty constitutes a maldistribution of human rights. Restorative justice is one of the primary concerns of some theorists of global justice who are concerned about colonization, decolonization, and contemporary versions of transnational exploitation. And those global justice advocates who focus on, and by this I mean activists, who focus on compensation for the families of workers killed in an unsafe work environment or redress for communities destroyed by oil extraction, debt relief. These are issue areas of people who use the restorative justice model. According to Aristotle, restorative justice corrects for action or inactions that were not proportionate, not based on desert. Richard Posner and Cass Sunstein recognize that there are these historical injustices in acquisition and transfer, to use Nozick's term, that have left significant portions of the world's population in poverty, while arguing that issues of climate injustice should be disaggregated from issues of global poverty. A third approach uses reciprocity. Aristotle distinguishes reciprocity from distributive and restorative justice. For many, this is a form of the golden rule. For Aristotle, money facilitates justice as reciprocity because we can exchange things of value. But money is not necessarily um, part of reciprocity. In fact, as Carol Gould interprets, interprets it, the social roots of social justice are in and rely on cultivating, and I quote, empathy and reciprocity in the relations of social life, close quote. And they are the basis for solidarity and democratic dialogue across borders. In fact, all three of these notions of justice, distributive, restorative, and reciprocity, for Aristotle and those who follow him, treat injustice and justice as if it can be corrected by passing a thing from person to person, though I often get contested on whether that uh, entitlement property metaphor is working in all of these notions. But maybe we can more generally agree that what they're doing is trying to work on a scale, to try to balance a scale. For Aristotle and those who theorize about justice in, the, in these three ways, injustice means being out of relationship. Each theorist of justice has a particular understanding of the currency of that relationship, but the idea is to bring us back into relationship. My argument is that the scope of justice, is this scope of justice is incomplete, leaving out much of the complexity and the contingency of human life, leaving out the dynamics that make transforming those relationships so complicated, leaving out the dynamics of forming those relationships in the first place. If we think less about the relationship that characterizes distribution, restoration, and reciprocity in justice, <coughs> and more about the dynamics of those relationships, we will be thinking about um, more about what Mill meant when he talked about injustice itself. <coughs> 
seen in this light, Aristotle's typology is an upward starting place for theorizing about injustice, um, even injustice related to distribution, injury, and asymmetry, because it draws our attention to the consequences of injustice and not injustice itself by focusing on the metrics, not its power dynamics. If we, as we will see throughout the book, particularly if our discussions of methodol in our discussions of methodology, it is very important for us to have methods of seeing injustice itself, and sometimes measurable me metrics play an important role in that. But we never want to confuse the measure of the problem with the problem itself. For example, the abuse of a power dynamic in the form of exploitation can cause harms that can be noticed with the metrics used for distribution. The lens through which an injury would be perceived or the notion of what reciprocity requires are not part of Aristotle's calculus. However, we can look at these critically and see that if a hierarchy is perceived as unjust by some, but normal by others, as historically hierarchies between Europeans and the colonies, between men and women, and among castes, and among ethnic groups have been perceived, there is no mechanism within these first three kinds of injustice to reevaluate the metric by which desert and even membership is determined in a political community. In fact, Aristotle is confident that there will be justice among equals who share a common life. Justice, and I quote from Aristotle, in, in political matters is found among men who share a common life in order that their association bring them self-sufficiency and who are free and equal. On Aristotle's own account, none of these metrics, distributive, restorative, and reciprocity, is relevant to global justice because we don't share a common life. The world is not sustainably self-sufficient, and the people of the world are not free and equal by any measure of those. Some of the problems of injustice may be characterized by some as matters of distribution, restoration, or reciprocity, but such characterization is based on a narrow analysis of injustice and conceals within it an Aristotelian ontology of political community. These characterizations, are not attentive to the historical patterns that create a lack of common life with exploitable and oppressive hierarchies. The patterns of consumption that are not self-sufficient and that undermine the potential self-sufficiency of future generations, and the normative judgments and values that render neither of those concerns for injustice in certain cases. The theory of injustice needs a political account of a common life self-sufficiency, and norms of recognition. Injustice itself is the lack of these. Many, for many engaged in struggles against injustice itself, the terrain of contestation around these is really around these three issues. The Aristotelian views of justice measure injustice with a scale. To correct for everyday injustices, I argue, we need to study the causes of the imbalance, not merely correct the imbalance. We need to evaluate the power dynamics that create the scale and the metric, not merely align with it. This is the difference between Christoph and Dunn's attention to need and Cole's demand that we reason out the need for the need. The latter anticipates a transformation of the power dynamics of common life, essential for addressing injustice itself. So let me give you a hint about what that means for responsibility. Just as Aristotle's disaggregation of systemic, relational, and universal justice is a helpful typology for thinking about the multiple meanings of justice, even though it was kind of harsh on the relational piece, the disaggregation of responsibility can help clarify the relationship among the many forms of responsibility we take up. By responsibility, we can mean responsibility within an existing legal and social system of obligation. These would be obligations under the law, economic norms, and society. Some of these are formal, some are informal. But by responsibility, we might instead mean responsibility within our relations to one another. This can be by virtue of friendship, family, or economic contract, for example. These two distinct meanings of responsibility um, or I think they're two distinct meanings of responsibility, but many would argue that 
the first, um, the basis of the first, really lies in the second, in those relationships. But you can see that these are two different meanings of the word responsibility captured by the same word. That said, they are connected. As Jennifer Nadelsky points out in Law's Relations, there are many ways in which law assumes and relies on interpersonal relations. Third, by responsibility, we might also mean responsibility that is not relative to any particular system or particular relations, but rather responsive, not only to particular harms, but also to the injustices of the system itself through any combination of unjust causal processes, power relations, and norms. This is responsibility analogous to and responsive to what that Jowett translation of the Nicomachean Ethics refers to as universal justice. In the vein of responsive responsibility, Robert Gooden argues that we are responsible for protecting the vulnerable, regardless of our relationship to the cause of the vulnerability or to those who are vulnerable. Iris Marion Young draws on Gooden, and I'm going to quote her at length. And at some point in there, she's going to quote good and be patient with me. If we agree that there is injustice, then we are saying that somebody ought to do something about it. As Robert Gooden remarks, if somebody ought to do something about a harm, but the task has not been assigned to anyone in particular, then, quote, we are responsible for seeing that it be done. Back to Young. This is precisely what it means to say that the responsibility is shared. This also shows how the responsibility is a political responsibility. We all share this responsibility not by virtue of our particular capacities, institutional roles, relationships, or commitments, but because we have the responsibility in general as citizens, which does not necessarily mean as citizens of a particular nation state, but rather as participants in social processes that we hope will do justice to us and thus whose justice we are obliged to promote. A general responsibility for justice accompanies all of our particular roles and responsibilities. It is not something over and above them. Close that very long quote. In this passage, Young articulates many reasons for taking responsibility for injustice. I'm going to look at those more carefully later in the book, so I'm not going to go into it with you now here. But the key is, that it is responsive to seeing that justice be done, and it is not particularly tied to a causal story, or even actually, well, she's quite complicated there, and, um, and I'm gonna argue that there, needs, there is more work that needs to be done on theorizing that political responsibility that she wants us to take up. In addition, I'm gonna argue that it's important to think about how we take it up. But for you, for you, we're just gonna focus on um, injustice itself. The reason that the distinction among these approaches to responsibility is important is because one of the dimensions of injustice itself is that we do not have a shared sense of a system. We do not have a shared understanding of who we are in relation to other individuals and groups. Injustice itself includes the epistemologies and the processes that divide us. Gooden and Young and I agree that the conditions of injustice itself call out to take up responsibility to see that it be done. However, in order for our responsive, responses to be responsive, in order for our responses to injustice itself to be responsive to the particular and diffuse causal forces, in order for our responses to injustice itself to undo the processes of power dynamics and normalization that foster and maintain and conceal these, Responsibility is not merely a question of whether or not we have it, but also of what it entails. So let me talk about, as I said, there are three um, aspects of this. Causality, which we expect and are familiar with. Power relations, which has been the subject of some scholars, not all. And normalization, which is um, for many theorists of responsibility, including that and injustice is kind of a stretch. I'm going to focus on causality, and then when I do that, I'm going to incorporate some of the other arguments just so you can uh, see it come. For most people, whether theorists or activists in struggle or witness to the suffering and struggles of others, and as Carol's noted, this project is grounded in um, studying women's human rights activists and particularly labor rights activists. 
this. I'm going to share with you a bit about the work of labor rights activists in response to the Rana Plaza building collapse, um, whose anniversary we are actually celebrating um, two years ago, uh, the 24th. That was four days ago. Was that last Friday? Um, and I do, I do want to say celebrate in the sense that. Um, 1,134 uh, 1, people died in that disaster. Many um, survived, and many um, families were left without a significant or their sole provider. That certainly isn't cause for celebration. But that event has been catalytic in getting retailers, global retailers, to understand the importance of um, paying attention to worker safety in the workplace and to recognize that even though the sites where their goods are made are very far away, um, that they have some responsibility to that. And on that day of, um, of remembering, two years ago, back on, on April 24th, the Children's Place, which has been, um, which was one of the retailers who were manufacturing in the Rana Plaza, um, in one of the Rana Plaza factories, they took responsibility and contributed additional funds to the Survivors Fund. So that's that and many other um, rights-based activism inform my argument about what taking responsibility means because people take responsibility for injustice when they respond to it and not just when they um, feel that they have a causal link to the harm. So, I recognize that many people do um, think that causality is the heart of taking responsibility for injustice. And just therefore, determining causality of a harm is a key aspect of determining the nature of um, its unjustness. Causality can be used to determine if a harm was unjust or just bad luck. And causality can be used to assign responsibility if the harm is determined to be unjust and a result of action or inaction. <coughs> but I want to distinguish the causality of the unjustness of a particular harm from the causality of injustice itself. When a court tries a police officer for killing an unarmed civilian, the issue is whether the officer was justified in his use of force. When, a social, move when social movement actors lie down on the freeway, they protest not merely an act or a verdict, but more so the patterns of harm that are evidence of injustice itself, or at least to borrow from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that warrant skeptical scrutiny. In this example, these patterns in racial profiling and traffic stops and sentencing differences by race, incarceration rates by race, provide the context for interpreting the death of an African American youth as not merely unjust, but also an indicator of injustice itself. We can use the unjust actions behind the Rana Plaza building collapse as indicators that the collapse is not only unjust, but evidence of injustice itself. A range of actors are implicated in the unjust actions related to that building collapse. The building owner did not have clear title to the land on which the building was built. Some government agents acted or failed to act such that the owner was allowed to construct a building without clear title. Unclear title plagues land ownership in Bangladesh and creates opportunities for misappropriation of land and unclear oversight. The particular parties to particular cases may commit unjust actions or inactions. However, the systemic nature of unclear land title is one aspect of injustice itself with a causal impact on land usage and oversight. The owner constructed an unsafe building adding two additional floors of generators to power the textile machines on the six floors below it. That's because in Bangladesh, we lose power often. But factories need to produce, regardless of whether um, the electricity is flowing from the grid. The owners construct, so the owner constructed this unsafe building. That makes the owner, the engineers, and the construction company all conspiring in the unsafe construction which made those who worked in the building vulnerable. The range of actors complicit in the fault of design were not a uniquely unfortunate collaboration, unfortunately. Rather, the inadequacy and the political nature of their collaboration and oversight suggests that many other factories may also be constructed in an inferior manner, and that faulty construction is not a function of error 
but rather an indication of injustice itself. Workers in the building saw cracks, they worried about the structure, and at the risk of losing their jobs, they called government inspectors. After weeks of prodding government inspectors, they came and they closed the building. The next day, the ground floor offices remained closed, but the factory floor managers, who had committed to units of production for months, reopened the factories and threatened the workers who did not work with termination. At 8 a.m., they started up the production lines. At 8.45, the electricity faltered. The generator kicked on, kicked on, and the workers heard the sound of the building supports buckling, and the building collapsed around them. As this review shows, while there are individual actors who can be seen as causally responsible for the poor construction of this particular factory building, and for these particular work workers being in the building that day, um, and being in the building on the day after it had been closed by inspectors. These particular causal mechanisms also reveal injustice in construction and workplace safety in Bangladesh more generally. I also want to argue that while it calls out for us to hold the owner, the engineers, the contractors, the government regulators, and the factory managers responsible for this injustice and for this unjust collapse, the unjust power relations require that we understand causality more broadly. The desire to understand causality in this broader sense will lead us to want to understand the power relations that contain and conceal these broader causal processes, and to want to understand the way that processes of normalization render the patterns less visible, even though the cracks were quite visible to the workers. It can be difficult to identify the causal mechanisms of the harm, either because they appear to be outside of the realm of human agency, such as a natural disaster, or a matter of a building collapse. Or we might think of them as a matter of bad luck, such as um, a building collapse in the context of an earthquake. Often, the harms of injustice are visible, such as the deaths of workers, in a factory fire or building collapse. Other harms of injustice could have been seen, such as the dust in the lungs of textile workers or asbestos exposure to, um, of workers in the ship recycling industry in Bangladesh. But they're not known publicly, and even to the workers themselves, um, in this case, because of low access to health care. Some injustices are simple or complex causal chains of inaction in action. Well, there is more to injustice than just that causal chain when we are concerned about injustice itself. We should look for these causal forces for sure. They may be obvious, but they also may be subtle. In the case of the Rana Plaza building collapse, it's not difficult to identify the immediate causal mechanisms and not too difficult to see behind these to the political causal mechanisms. Interestingly, two of the power dynamics that are part of injustice itself in the global garment industry um, and its workplaces are broadly known. Insufficient government oversight and the exploitable economic opportunity in the global garment industry. In the case of the safety of the global garment industry, the, change for, the challenge for actors willing to take responsibility is to work with and around those who were not. And the Children's Place um, is, one, is one retailer who became responsible, but initially they were not the first mover. PVH, um, which is uh, the manufacturer of Calvin Klein and um, or some other brands, Fruit of the Loom. These are brands that responded more immediately because they had a previous experience of working in conversation with, um, with workers and worker advocacy groups. Familiarity with seemingly familiar, familiar uh, hello, you can edit this out too. <laughs> Familiarity with seemingly similar problems may lead to misinterpretation. For example, initially, people who were not following the news coverage of the Rana Plaza building collapse assumed that the failure of go was government oversight and that they were responsible for the deaths. In fact, though it had taken weeks of worker and worker advocates um, advocacy to get the building inspected, it had been expected, inspected and it had been closed. In fact, just the day before the disaster, as I said. However, that coincidence does not mean that government 
inspections are not an issue. Bangladesh's 18 inspectors are insufficient for the over 5,000 factories. Yet this claim is a political distraction. If safety were a requirement for success in the global market, Bangladesh would improve its safety record. And in fact, safety has been important to Bangladesh's export shrimp industry. And when they were called out on that, because there was an immediate alternative source of shrimp from other countries, they corrected the problem. The Bangladesh um, gets has a $19 billion um, ready-made garment industry, which is 78% of its exports. The key factor in the managers forcing workers back to work in an unsafe building is the structure of the global garment industry, in which production firms can be for business on both cost per item and quantity per month. These pressures were instrumental in the back to work orders. So, though the government can and should hold responsible the building owner, the factory managers, and any in government administration who facilitated their misconduct, these individual actors made decisions under the influence of a global political economy in which brands struggle to keep consumer prices low and fashion fresh. And the government of Bangladesh and local production companies struggle to keep Bangladeshi garment production the lowest price competitor in the market. It is second only to um, China in ready-made garment production. Certainly, these aspects of causality have been recognized by workers and their advocates who are concerned with the unjustness of the Rana Plaza building collapse, but also view it as evidence of a broader pattern of injustice. When we reflect on the role of the global political economy in the Rana Plaza building collapse, those forces are an important context, not to excuse the individual actors, the owner, the engineers, the managers, but rather to enable us to appreciate that the same global pressures have consequences for working conditions within the garment industry in Bangladesh, beyond the garment sector, for example, I mentioned the industrial ship recycling business, and across low-wage workers around the world. However, for many injustices, a causal chain cannot be proven. The title issues in my talk today, Economic, Environmental, and Gender Justice, are all of these categories, in that even though some causes can be identified, the causal chain can never be proven. This is due both to the complex bureaucracy of social organization and to the complexity of forces affecting these problems. Yet, the opaqueness and the inadequacy of causal explanations does not deter many from taking up responsibility for these injustices. In this discussion of the causal forces of, unju of unjustness and injustice, I've also noted the roles of power relations and normalization within these. And I am not going to share with you um, too much in detail about those other two, but I would um, be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Let me conclude. In the attempt to understand what justice and responsibility require by examining injustice, I'm following Aristotle. Certain injustices are comprehensible through iconic images, a good prisoner, with arms outstretched at Abu Ghraib, for example. But others defy iconic imagery. The image of a worker in a garment factory does not challenge the narrative of global economic growth, or reveal the risks of global labor injustice, or suggest ways of taking responsibility for those injustices in a just way. It may be iconic, the image of a woman, or rows and rows of women, at sewing machines in a developing country may be an iconic image, but not necessarily iconic of injustice itself. For many, the working woman is an image of women's empowerment through inclusion in the formal economy, or of the ways in which women's employment in the formal economy delays marriage and childbearing, giving her more power at home. Similarly, images of parents lining up for relief aid do not reveal the complexity behind a food crisis. These may be iconic of poverty, but really of just the need. And they don't explain the need for the need. They are not necessarily iconic images of injustice itself. 
These images might be used to call the economically privileged to a philanthropic response, but they cannot capture the explanation for 170 million people living with hunger. Nor do these images suggest the potential political agency and transformative change that not just those who suffer from hunger, but those of us who want to take responsibility for it can engage in. Just as cameras cannot quite capture the complexity that underlies these injustices, a single focus theoretical lens cannot capture these injustices either. We need to look at the global and local dimensions of problems of injustice in order to reveal the political demands of such problems. If we take seriously the dynamics of injustice itself, complex causality, power relations, and normalization, transformative change is necessary to confront injustice itself in order not to nibble at the consequences of unjust power, but rather to redress injustice itself, we need to take respo political responsibility. We need to take responsibility for defining and exercising the necessary roles of political agency. We need to challenge the epistemological and political dynamics that put us in these states. This means taking a critical view of philanthropic and consumer activism, but perhaps surprisingly, it also means taking a critical view of some community-based activism. However, before we can flesh out these evaluative tools we, um, and what these entail, we need to further develop our understanding of complexities related to injustice and, unjust, and unjustness. And so while I have focused on these more structural aspects with you today, the next chapter um, pushes the boundary of what we, what many scholars often understand our responsibility extending to by going to where Gooden and Young are, and that is talking about vulnerabilities, whether they are, whether we can, under, regardless of how we understand their sources of power. So I'll stop there and take your questions and hopefully offer you some more illustrations. Thanks very much.